This episode of the Music Production Podcast is brought to you by the members of my Music Production Club. The Music Production Club is a monthly subscription service that gives you some new music production tools in your inbox every month. The August 2020 download is 808's Ableton Live Pack. And that's a collection of instruments and tools you can use to make your own tuned bass drum instruments. So basically, it's like having a kick drum with a long sustained tone that you can use for bass lines. Very popular in a lot of modern music. And this Ableton Live Pack will get you those heavy, deep bass sounds that you need to make that sound. You also get the Ableton Live Pack archive of all my free packs in one convenient download. My What Bob Ross Teaches Us About Music Production book. My live performance with Ableton Live video course. We've got Zoom meetings where we go over different uh, topics and questions and answers and hang out and talk about music production. There's a Discord server to share ideas with like-minded producers, and there's also special offers and discounts from other companies around the internet. That's my music production club. Um, if you want to help out the podcast and get some cool stuff in your inbox, head over to brianfunk.com slash mpc to join. How's it going, everybody? Welcome to the Music Production Podcast. I'm your host, Brian Funk. On today's show, I have Steven, the artist Steven, a.k.a. Steven Swartz. And um, he's a, I have a, uh, maybe electronic musician, but I think there's more to it than that. It's got a lot of like um, acoustic and um, organic sounds in there. Um, got a lot of different influences, too. I, I hear some like rock and roll, indie rock. I also hear electronic and even like some hip hop, I'd say. A nice blend. But uh, Steven's here to talk to us today. He's got a new album coming out called Arcasia. 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 I messed it up again. <laughs> we went over this too beforehand. But Arcasia. Um, I guess I'll, I'll probably ask you, what does that mean anyway? Because I've never heard uh, of Arcasia is the, yeah, that's uh, the state of mind in which we act against our better judgment through weakness of will. So what that what that pretty much means is um, when you choose something that is more instantly gratifying but uh, not fulfilling in the long run and mm. why we choose to do things that aren't best for us over the things that are best for us. Right. So that's um, like the instant happy versus like a long-term fulfillment. Right. Like a quick yeah. fix of dopamine versus something that is... Not instantly entertaining, but rewarding in the long run. Right. I think so many of the things that are good for us are like that. You know, they 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 don't pay off immediately. Like working out, mm -hmm. for instance, like you know, especially mm -hmm. in the beginning, it's really tough. But it's it's like a long game you're playing. Yeah, it's amazing how many th how many of the things I've noticed in my life that feel really good once I start doing them usually end with me feeling not so good yeah. and then vice versa like the opposite it's like <laughs> there there's always like pain and then there's always reward and it's just like what order do they come in mm. yeah okay that's a cool way to look at it yeah because um there's a lot of reward to you know eating like a chocolate cake <laughs> instant it feels great yeah. but then uh but uh yeah when you when you're finished with the chocolate cake you just want more and if mm -hmm. you don't get more then you just feel upset or empty and mm. cake in your example is like a that's a that's a metaphor for so many things in our culture mm. that just grab our attention and steal our um yeah our interest right well um i think the answer to the question of the album kind of explains why I thought it'd be cool to have you on the show um, because you've got this like uh, this deeper message going on and um, a nice interest in not just like, you know, musical stuff as an artist, but also like personal growth mm. um, and the album title right there. I think, you know, even making an album is kind of like one of those experiences. Like it, it can be kind of painful. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, I mean, I think every time I've made a song, there's pain in somewhere in the process. <clears throat> it's not. It's not just all good, you know. Yeah, yeah. No, that comes in a lot of ways. Sometimes it's just the actual act of putting music together, but it can also just be like what you're dealing with within the music too. Yeah, and this album in particular. I mean, just based off the title, you can already tell. 
um, was a bit of a a mad process of ups and downs and throwing myself into things and um, yeah, it was there was a it was a chaotic process for sure. Mm. So maybe I can ask you to um, just give us like maybe a little bit of your your background, musical history. You know what brought you to the point you're at because it seems like there's kind of a cool story to that. Sure. Well, I started my earliest memory was sitting. I think I've said this in every every time someone's asked me this. Um, was like sitting on my grandfather's lap. I think I was like two years old, just pressing buttons on on his baby grand piano, which I now have actually right behind me. Mm. Um, and uh, I mean, I didn't know what I was doing, but I loved it. And I think when I was about four or five, I asked my mom for piano lessons, and that was the beginning of my musical journey. Um, and then that turned into drums, and that turned into playing guitar and playing in bands and singing and producing. And I think about halfway through high school, that was when I realized I could actually, like up until that point, it was just something I loved to do. It was like, instead of playing games, I would just make music. It was like my escape from the world. Um, and then about halfway through high school, I realized like, oh man, I could actually do this for the rest of my life and like make a living out of this. Um, and then just over the years, the amount of depth and the amount of meaning and the relationship I have with music has just evolved and changed from not just something I enjoy doing, but something that for me at least is like a really integral part of my personal growth and coming to terms with emotions and experiences. And, um, yeah. Hmm. Yeah. I think, uh, those high school years are very like telling years, you know, you like ha to have something like that, you know, I, I think my interests and the friends I made through that are, are the things that got me through that point in my life. Just the, mm -hmm. you know, having art, having music, discovering, for me, it was more like right as high school started, I got into playing guitar. But um, nice. a lot of the things I was already into, like I was thought I was going to be like a comic book artist, you know? Oh yeah? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was into like making my own comics and drawings and cartoons, but music kind of took that over um, on a different level. But what did what did music have for you that that comic didn't? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I don't know. I, I think maybe the um, you know, like the visceral energy mm -hmm. of like playing with people in a band mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and like playing performing and stuff. Like as when you're drawing, I mean, you can of course like tap into some powerful emotions and reach people a lot, but the um the release you know of mm -hmm. getting to play with some other people and i mean every time i'm away from it for any amount of time i'm always like kind of surprised at like whoa that was powerful mm -hmm. i mean mm -hmm. just um within the last like week i got to play some music with some friends for the first time since we've done lockdown i'm in new york so um it was uh awesome you know just yeah, that man. release of energy it was like whoa I, I almost didn't even know i had that going on inside mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah it brings it out of you yeah it's it's like the it's like a sport almost like the physical um release you get and the energy i love the comparison between music and sports um in that sense but also like because i was an athlete my whole life and the <clears throat> The athletic mentality really serves, I think, any creative endeavor because mm. creating art requires like persistence and dedication and discipline. And like we're talking about, like putting up with pain and doing things you don't want to do. Mm. And um, sports like really endowed me with that that um, mentality, which I think has like, really served me. Yeah, yeah. I think we can romanticize like being artists and coming down to like you get struck by the inspiration lightning bolt. But I, well, I you do, but you got to work for it, you know. Yeah, I think like if you're waiting for that all the time, you're gonna spend most of your time waiting for it. But I think you... the muse kind of rewards the creator for for their effort. Like uh, that's what I've always noticed. Um, <clears throat> I. I have to work for my like I don't I don't just wake up inspired. I'm not just like, "Oh, I'm ready to create." Like 
I have to get into a routine of creating every day for mm -hmm. for at least a week until like something really special happens. And then you just get into this flow where you're not thinking, you're not you're not trying, you're just like throwing sounds around and then all of a sudden it's like you have like this idea comes and the sound comes and it doesn't feel like it's from you. Mm. But that doesn't usually happen right away. It takes a little bit of time. I totally agree. And there's a lot of times when I go to make music where at first I, I like I in my head I want to, but I don't feel like it kind of. <laughs> mm -hmm. But showing up consistently, like like you said, it does sort of like just reward you after a while. I think um getting going, you know, kind of like warming up, like getting That's the blood it, flowing yeah. athletically too is the same thing. There's a lot of times I don't want to exercise, but once you kind of move, you're like, oh yeah, this is a good idea. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I find that when I'm creating music, my I there's a certain state of mind that I get fixed into. Um, and that's where the really, the really powerful stuff comes from. But it's not the it's not the same mind state that you like engage in the world with normally. Like mm. when somebody calls me, like when I'm in the studio, like it's always so weird. Like I'm not I'm not like a functional person. Like I'm in a very different headspace. Um and certain I think what happens is certain parts of my brain actually get turned off and it creates more energy for like the other more creative, chaotic parts to come out. Um Yeah. Mm. So they kind of catch you with like your lab coat on and the mad scientist. Yeah, dude. Uh, yeah, mind. for sure. <laughs> and yeah. sometimes I'm also just very stoned, in which case I just become very introverted. But <laughs> mm. yeah, I can do it too. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got this new record coming out, but you've also, um, before we maybe get to that, um, there's kind of, to me, like from reading about your bio and stuff, it seems like there's a bit of a buildup, like you had some success a couple of years ago with mm -hmm. some tunes and some uh with your release but um yeah sincerely yeah so but then you kind of stepped away from that a little bit yeah well <clears throat> i put out that album and um it did really well uh did a tour played some festivals everything was going great i got i got um lyme disease and had to go back home um to, to recover from that for like about a year Where's and home for took, you? Uh, Virginia. Oh, Virginia. Okay. Lyme mm -hmm. disease is like such a northeast. Dude, like, northeast. Yeah. Yep, yep. yep. I'm on Long it Island, really which weird... is uh, one of the most popular places <laughs> for Lyme disease. Wait, what, what's that? On Long Island is. Uh, oh, is that you where know? you're from? Yeah, yeah. Oh, cool. My mom's from Long Island. Nice. Yeah, it's beautiful, <laughs> but uh, you gotta you gotta check yourself if you go out into nature. Oh yeah, dude. It's yeah. it's. Yeah, it's it's really deadly out there and I guess we still don't really know exactly what happened. I think the the Lyme community is like still very uneducated about the disease. Like there's a lot of conflicting opinions. When I had it, there the medical community literally said that there's no such thing as chronic Lyme disease. Like you either have it and you get treated and it goes away in like a couple weeks mm. or you don't have it. And what I had was like my doctor told me it was like a late onset or something. Like I got bit many years before and it didn't affect me until then. <clears throat> I don't really know, man. But it was it was pretty brutal. But it, it was definitely um, a, a massive learning experience to go through something that's so out of my control. And um, when I got back, it was it was so nice being back. But it took me about a year, maybe even longer to kind of get back into the swing and figure out what it is that I wanted to do next. So there was about like a two, two and a half year hiatus there where I was pretty inactive. Yeah, that's what I hear a lot from people that get it. And a lot of times they don't know they, what it is for a very long time. But it's not like this thing you kind of get over pretty quickly. It really does. Yeah, I mean, I, I hear game. horror stories of people who still, like they've had it for years or like they've had it for 10 years or 20 years and mm. oh, it sounds so terrible dude so you came out of that with a new i guess outlook on things well here's what's weird is the doctor that uh the doctor that treated me who's like an angel she actually got her medical license taken away because she was doing like unorthodox things and 
it worked. So it sucks mm. for her that that they're shutting her down. You know, but wow. Hmm. I think there's a lot we don't know. You know, and that yeah. Still, oh yeah, for sure. We're seeing that right now with the condition of the, the world with uh, the coronavirus. Like you know, like. I think uh, a lot of it gets politicized, but I think the truth is like people just don't know. Like we're we're learning, yeah. we're figuring it out, and it's uh, the, yeah. it's a complicated machine we got here, the human body. It's very complicated. Hmm. Yeah, that's good to say that I don't know, man. Like <laughs> yeah, yeah. We live we live <laughs> in a time where everybody gets like I feel like most people are uninformed about most topics, but but they still are very passionate about their opinions and they're very stubborn. And like, I don't know. I think, I think the world would be a better place if more people could just say like, I don't know. Mm. <laughs> I don't know what to think. This is complicated. Yeah. Instead of forming an opinion and, and picking a side or a party. Yeah. Yeah. I think you might be hitting on to one of our main weaknesses and it's especially true these days. I teach high school English as the day job. And um, the day I got comfortable saying, I don't know, to a question, what a relief. Nice. You know, like, because at first right. you're like, you know, when I first start, I'm the teacher. I have to, you know. Right. I have to know everything. Yeah. Right? Well, they won't trust me if I don't know everything. But I, as I quickly learned, they trust you more if you just admit right. it. it. And it's powerful and it, it makes you learn more too, but instead of just saying whatever kind of knee jerk reaction you have. Yeah, exactly. And then you're not so defensive and on your toes about people asking you questions. Mm. You're just like being real. Yeah, I've found that I think I wrap my identity up with my beliefs a lot less. Mm -hmm. You know, like they're just just beliefs and uh, they can change. I've seen them change in my life many times. and That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, to have that That's such is, an admirable it's freeing trait instead of like feeling man. like you're on the defense. Hmm. Absolutely. So you took a trip after that? Is that how the story goes? I took a trip. Oh, after getting sick? Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, I got sick. I came back to LA after a year. Took a year to kind of try things and experiment. My managers ended up dropping me because they wanted me to put out a bunch of music that I didn't didn't like. And they felt like... I was just different from their other artists and I didn't fit in and it just wasn't working out. Um, but really I just needed more time. Um, and then I created a little EP, which still to this day is like, I mean, forever, I think it'll be one of my favorite pieces of art. It is so deep and so powerful. It kind of went under the radar cause I just independently released it. No label, no managers. Um, and it's also pretty experimental. Um, is that but it's definitely the, like a little gem that that I think people will come back to and find. So I made that, and then pretty much right after putting that out, I went to Thailand for a couple months and just explored and lit, had these long days of just adventuring in a foreign land and meeting people, and it was so wonderful, man. Yeah. So it's kind of interesting that... um you would find some success and then um, not just get kind of pressured into the hustle of just cranking things out just mm -hmm. to put it out. Um, how did, how was that f making that decision for you? Was that like a challenge to not like listen? I'm sure like your manager's like, listen, Steven, you know, we've been doing this for a long time <laughs> and like, this is the formula. Yeah. I mean, when it comes to the music, I am very firm in whether or not I feel like something represents my voice and what it is I'm trying to say. Um, nobody could have convinced me to put out any of the songs that I didn't like. Mm. Um, and I think a lot of my career and a lot of like the I, I'm like a very intuitive person, I think like if something feels right, then it's right. If something feels wrong, then it's wrong. And I trust my gut. Um, and that's, and that's how it happens. So, you know, and I'm happy I did that because <laughs> yeah, I'm so happy I did that in yeah. hindsight. Yeah. I guess you'd never know where you'd wind up after that. Yeah. There's really no way to know. 
Mm. Nice. And um, when did you come back from Thailand? Um, I got back just over a year ago. Yeah, about a year ago. Okay. And then I moved into this house that I'm in now. And uh, that's when I started a couple weeks after getting back, set up the studio, started mm -hmm. working on on the new album. Nice. So we'll, and uh, start and right before I left for Thailand, I found new managers too. Okay, and they've been incredible. Yeah, that's cool. So how does the starting the album process work for you? Now, like, because um, in looking at, I'm not, I forget the terminology that was used. This this web page that kind of flips over. It's got like a concept for each song, which I'll put it in the show notes um, if that's cool with you. But I think cool. it, yeah, I actually don't even know. What you're referring to? Um, well, it's um. Is it like a description of what every song is like? Yeah, it's on? got like the oh, track list, and then it's kind of got like the concept of each one. Interesting. Okay. <laughs> I guess I wrote that. <laughs> I don't remember. Well, um, it what I what struck me about it is it really seemed like there was like a vision, you know, and that's kind of where I'm, I'm coming at this question with is like, um, you know, um how did this begin for you like um how did you get this mm -hmm. up did you have this in mind or does is this something no, that comes no, together no, i never i'm not a conceptual creator so I, I have a lot of friends that are conceptual creators meaning they sit down they hear a song in their head already they know what they want to create they know the mood um and they're really good at executing ideas the way that i create is like i just start like i like I create best in a playful kind of environment where there's no pressure and there's no direction or no box at all. And um, when I got back from Thailand, I mean, I probably did a couple days of organizing. Like that's really important before creating anything is organizing your stuff. So, you know, getting your samples together, um, making, doing some sound design. I always do like a week or two of sound design before I go in on something just to have a new palette to play with. Um, and, uh, and then it's just, yeah, I mean, I just sit down and start throwing sounds together and, and, and really turning off my brain and then, um, things through, through the, through a process of persistence and trust, like things just start emerging. Mm. And I think it's because of the, because I'm not trying to control where it goes, these like really beautiful themes just start naturally emerging because I think you're creating from like an unconscious place and your unconscious mind is so connected and powerful. Um, and our conscious mind, our ability, like our conceptual mind is just so limited. So I really try to get out of the, out of the way of that when I'm creating. Mm -hmm. Are you... Um are you very strict about like using this palette you've created in the sound design phase? No, I'm not really strict at all. I mean, it's just nice to have, and it's just nice to have at least like starting points, you know, like a lot of times I'll pull a sound in that I made and I made it while I was designing sounds, not in the context of writing a song. So sometimes it's just like not perfect or maybe it doesn't fit exactly what I need, but um, it's nice. It's a good starting point. And then, you know, I made it. So I know, I know how to change things and how to do stuff. And, mm -hmm. and so I can tweak from there. That's cool. Any tools you prefer to use? Any? Let's see. What did I use for a crazy? I, you know what? You know what synth I used a lot in that album is um, the new Ableton synth called Wavetable. Yeah. I think yeah. Is what it's called. Wavetable. Yeah. yeah. It's like really simple. It's like dumb simple. Um, but I generally like really simple plugins. Mm -hmm. Like I downloaded Massive X and I use that sometimes, but that's like a really complicated VST. Like that, there's so much control you have over that. Um, I like things that are just quick. And a lot of my sound design is not coming from the synth itself. It's coming from, you know, the plugins that come after it you know i use a lot of distortion i design a lot of sounds into distortion mm -hmm. so like i'll throw like a decapitator like isotope trash after wavetable just on a sine wave and then i'll just kind of build it out from there it's one of my favorite ways to play with a new plugin is to just open sometimes wavetable sometimes operator 
but with the sine mm. wave default. And if I can do cool things to just such a simple, clean sound, oh it's, yeah, it's kind of like I know I got a cool device. On Dude, my hand. it's that <laughs> the, the secret to my all of my favorite synths that I've made is like really like sine wave esque, like low harmonic content um, starting points going into plugins that add color. Mm -hmm. um, there's something about the darkness of like sine waves and warm sounds that just get brought to life by distortion. It's crazy. And just all of these accidents come out of it and you just find these little nodes that are like out of this world beautiful. Yeah, I, I find that too because if you go with a more complex waveform like a saw or square, it's kind of already got all that extra information. It's put taken into up it. so much space, you know. Yeah, yeah. And, and the various distortions and plugins you can throw on all have like their own sort of harmonic richness, and yeah. um, it can be really interesting to just discover where they kind of add their little magic to. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm, totally. And I thought it was cool, I was, especially I was like um, listening to the song Delilah that you did. Um, I, I love the juxtaposition of like the, the regular piano. Just, mm -hmm. Is that the piano, your grandfather's on that track? Um, that piano is, is an upright I have upstairs, actually. Mm -hmm. So I use that upright on so many of my songs. Um, I got it for free off Craigslist like six years ago. <laughs> nice. Just picked it up. My piano yeah. is a Salvation Army find. <laughs> nice. Yeah, yeah. dude. The, honestly, the old like uprights are so sick. Yeah. They have so much character. Yeah. Um, it turns out mine was made in 1913. Wow. Yeah. Mine's like in that era too. Yeah. That's so cool. I made an Ableton Live pack out of it. Sampled all. The Did you really? Nice. Yeah. Well, I got like kind of interested in this piano because it obviously had been played a lot like the keys were worn down the the um, hammers were like they just were like to the bone you know <laughs> so like everything about the piano like was wear and tear and it just got me thinking like this thing's a hundred years old it's probably had multiple owners mm -hmm. and i got really excited about thinking about packaging that up and then like letting other people use it other people experience it right just let this piano live on and right right you know um and yeah, I mean, cool. I, I love things that feel old and, and like have been touched by different people. And like I like houses that are old houses that feel lived in. And mm. um, yeah, I just like the feeling of history in anything. Yeah, that's I think what I'm like always shooting for whenever I'm making music or making sounds is mm -hmm. to find that like character that like lived in feeling. I mean, because we have, you know, open up live, you've got grand piano, like the preset, and it's a beautifully right, it's like the most recorded. perfect, beautiful piano you've ever heard. Yeah, yeah, it's wonderful, you know, like to have access to sounds like that is kind of incredible. But it's like, maybe, maybe it's my fault that I'm like too rough around the edges when I play my, my music mm -hmm. and sing and do things like that, that that piano and me don't always mix so well. <laughs> well, this is what's cool about 2020 and, and where music is going is because of Splice and because of just the power of computers, everybody has access to really, really high quality mm. stuff. Like when I, was, when I started producing like in, I don't know, middle school or whatever like i remember spending like <laughs> a week trying to make a snare drum sound like the snare drum in the records that i liked and i i couldn't even come close you know yeah and um i think we went through an era of music where perfect and clean was kind of like special because it was hard to do it was hard to get there it took like a certain level of expertise but now like clean and, and sounding really good is is just so, it's like corny at this point. Like everybody can do it. I mean, it's some people do it really point. well. Yeah. Some people do it really well. Like I, I was just hanging out with, with m my good friend Kyle yesterday. Um, he's in this group called Gray. And they make like the, the cleanest, most beautifully executed like pop music. And it's incredible. But what's cool about 2020 is 
what what at least for me when i listen to music what stands out to me it's not this like a song isn't the sum of its parts like um it's there's like an x factor to music and i think a lot of my favorite artists are playing with the contrast between clean and and ugly or mm -hmm. feeling really harmonic and beautiful and feeling really dissonant and uncomfortable and things intentionally being kind of bad it's really cool it's really it's it's truly becoming like a, a, a more complex art form because of that and it's it's really interesting to see where it's gonna go yeah it's a, that's a cool point because for so long it was striving to get it to sound as clean and perfect as you can and you always kind of missed you know like for whatever reason you don't have the right room or mics and uh -huh. and a lot i think looking back that's where a lot of the character came from but nowadays exactly. we almost start like a default like perfect like the a loop you can drag into your track you could is, literally just go to splice bring a loop in and you've got a song <laughs> yeah it's and, it, and it's like immaculate recorded drums right. amazing this amazing that and you know you sound like you really know what you're doing and you're really just dragging some loops in but um that that is where for me a lot of the fun happens is when it's like oh what's that that's cool what's that that sound in there that makes me feel like I'm somewhere or mm -hmm. like this really mm -hmm. happened amongst people. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly, man. I, I think I'm um, in the beginning. I might've said like, like kind of like a rock and roll background because, um, I noticed on like some of the songs, like you go from like a very soft, sometimes even like a falsetto singing kind of voice. Mm -hmm. And the next thing it's, you know, it's almost like, just all out screaming mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like not doesn't seem like it's a it's a melody even it's just we're belting it out yeah um and i think that like kind of captures a little bit of what you're saying this like these two worlds kind of combining and crashing into each other yeah 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 i've always loved contrast in music like that was one of the first things i remember being like a like a secret trick uh to making something feel special i did it in the first song that i ever put out um this song called bullet train which is like a indie dubstep song and um the contrast in that song was like this beautiful angelic voice that joni my friend joni sang over these like really this really heavy distorted you know womp wompy bass and I remember thinking to myself, like, if her voice was, like, if if underneath that super distorted wompy bass was, like, an equally distorted and aggressive voice, it wouldn't be nearly as special. Mm. Um, and I think about that contrast in so many dimensions when I'm creating, like, and I don't even know if I consciously think about it, but, like, when I'm picking my drums, like, if I have a really tight kick, it's really nice to have, like, a really fat floppy snare or like vice versa like a really floppy kick and like a really tight snare yeah. or um you know if i use like a synth patch for like a bass it's nice to use like a real instrument for some of the mid-range chords and um yeah i just i love contrast there's something so alluring about it well i think so much about music is contrast right like you can't have a loud part without a quiet part. You can't have mm -hmm. nothing. If you won't notice anything being sloppy, if everything's sloppy, and, and um, exactly because you normalize sloppy. It's just it's not sloppy anymore. It's just it's just like right. zero. They're all relative concepts. Uh huh. Exactly. Big, so small, you need, exactly. fast, slow. Um, that's a hard thing, though. I, I found for me, it took me a very long time to get at that as like um coming from playing in bands and then like recording my own stuff where i'm the, playing everything now I'm, mm -hmm. in my in my mind i'm like well the drums are going to be huge and the guitar is going to be huge and the vocal will be giant and the bass is going to be thumping and it right. was it was i it's finally just learned yeah it's just really flat yeah that they're all the same level like it was like, oh, if I want that big sound here, I got to make something small next to it. Exactly. That's how you get the sound. You don't, things don't sound big when everything's big. 
Things sound big when you have something big in the context of something not big. Right. I think of like, what is it to be tall? If you're in the right, NBA, you're, <laughs> like yeah, it's right, a lot right, different right, right, than right, if exactly. you're you know, riding racehorses or something. <laughs> Much I just found standard. out reading this book, Sapiens, that there's that there was this um, uh, type of Homo sapien. They're not Homo sapiens, but they're like Homo erectus. They had a, their unique name, but there was like this small island where these like tiny humans lived. They were all like midgets, and everything on the island was also like miniature. Like they were hunting like small elephants, <laughs> hmm. but like nobody on that island knew that they were small because everybody was small. It's just so funny. Yeah, I read that book a while back. Um, I it's remember a, something about one. that. It was like kind of like an untouched land, right? By, yeah, by yeah, it was, yeah. yeah. Pretty bizarre, man. Hmm. Yeah, it makes you think like, um, I guess like culturally too, you know, like in different parts of the world, like normal things are odd in, if you take them out of their context. But that's right. kind of... Um, if if it's in its context, it just blends in with the background of everything else. Right. And that's really like the trick you're playing in music is exploiting like opposites and exploiting opposites and, and challenge and I and I like I like challenging my listener. I like challenging like the the eternal struggle with music is like at least for me is that I want people to be able to relate to what I'm creating. Like, I don't want to make art that only I understand. But I also want to imprint my uniqueness and my weirdness into it. So it's like this combination of creating something for yourself that is as honest as it can be, but also um, executing it in a way that is relevant to, to the times and relevant to what's happening in music and culture. Mm -hmm. and it's something that is like going to be palatable for people um yeah and that's like like i always love the idea of like writing pop songs in disguise like they're not they don't sound like pop songs but they kind of are mm -hmm. you know that's kind of the challenge like it has to be familiar enough that people can still get to it but right it's exactly too familiar it's boring it's it's predictable What's happening now, which is exciting and I'm looking forward to diving more into it, is that some of my favorite artists get away with making really weird, like weirder music than we've heard in a while, mm. um, at least at the level that, of popularity they've gotten to. Um, and it's because they can contextualize it with these really beautiful videos or these really unique videos. And um, I think the combination of video and music obviously has been going on for a long time now. MTV, obviously, but like it's becoming like the music and the video feel like one, like they were created together. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I'm looking to, to forward to like being able to express my art through video more so that I can be a bit more experimental with my music and contextualize it through the video. Right, because you can kind of uh, carry the story a little bit with the visual where the music gets maybe a little weird. Well, that's the thing is like all like if and this is why a lot of my music, too, I like kind of breaking the is it breaking the fourth wall? Is that what it's called? Um, where like addressing the listener. Yeah. Or, or, or even just like I like adding things that make it feel like the listeners in the room with me. Mm -hmm. Like um, I do a lot of like I'll just add like chatter or like um room sounds or I don't even know what I do but like I want like because if if the listener could just be in the room with me right now while I was creating it and and connect with me and and understand what I'm feeling right now then everybody would get it you know what I mean um and that's that's like yeah that's what videos do too like they can help contextualize things for the listener for sure yeah I've found um I don't know, I guess I've paid more attention to it recently. And, and there's just been more documentation of it on the internet. But like, um, you know, like scores for movies and TV shows, 
like some of the stuff that's there's a lot out there now where you can like kind of learn about like what the composers were doing, what the sound designers were doing. Mm -hmm. And if you look at it from like a like a pop music perspective, it's like really weird. Like you you almost couldn't get away with it. But I wonder if like um and, but you know the the film like ties it all together and you almost don't even realize how strange mm -hmm. what you're hearing is. Right, right, exactly. Yeah. So I wonder if that's like something that's ha that kind of what you're talking about, if that's where it's coming together a little bit, that we're getting used to some of those things um, in what we watch and then the music can kind of almost follow that lead in the, into the weirdness. Yeah, <laughs> I, yeah. I, I find actually that when, I, when I'm listening to music, um, sometimes I'll hear a song and not like it, but it's just because I was like in the wrong context for experiencing it. Like yeah. I wasn't able to relate to that song in this moment but sometimes a song comes on that you've never heard and you're just like it fits exactly the mood that you're in and you're mm -hmm. just like oh yes and that's why like movies that or yeah songs and movies end up becoming so popular because people understand they're, they're in the journey with you like they're already in that headspace and then like here's this song and they're connecting it to this this journey that you're on mm. So. Yeah, that's a great point. Sometimes they just nail it, you know. It just oh, dude, it's so good, man. Um, I haven't even seen the movie, honestly, but um, or, or I don't know if I have, but I don't remember seeing the part. But um, the movie Philadelphia with Tom Hanks. From, I don't think I've seen it. It's like from the nineties. Um, I I don't want to get it wrong, but I believe you know he has AIDS and he's dying, and um, okay. I just came across this Neil Young song that's in the movie and I saw the footage of uh from the movie you know like um I think it's like him watching or maybe it's his family watching like old home videos of him mm -hmm. and like the song oh man like put like it was a beautiful song to begin with but when you put it in that context like you know it just adds so much dimension yeah and I I had gotten just enough of the context to get it when I saw the video and it was really moving. Mm -hmm. Like, um, it was almost like, I don't even know if I could watch that movie, <laughs> but like you're saying, like, it's just wow. put there perfectly to just grab you. But that, I remember really loving, um, do you remember citizen cope? No, he's, uh, he was like, uh, actually he, he grew up in DC really close to where I grew up. And, uh, he he like blew up because of movies like he just made music that fit this sort of like i don't know how to explain it if you heard, if you heard some of his top songs you'd know them but citizen cope yeah yeah mm -hmm. and yeah it's cool that it's cool when artists like blow up because of their placement in movies mm. it's pretty wild yeah that's i never thought of it the way you put it but it's so true that um, if you're not in the right spot for a song, like, you, you know, there's a time and place, you know. The song yeah, there's music a time and is, place for sure. I mean, some of my favorite songs, I actually don't listen to that often because they're, they're hard to relate to, like, on, like, a regular daily basis. But they're so, and they're too, they're almost too powerful. Hmm. They take, they take my entire being over. And it's not something you can just casually listen to. Yeah. Um, yeah, so. like, you kind of. You're not going to be at a party and put on that song. But if you no. are in the right, you know, you happen to be feeling down or whatever. And like this. No, oh, yeah. Sometimes there's just no you just better melt song into it to be depressed. It's like watching a movie, you know? Yeah. <laughs> it's like it's not just passive music in the background. It just takes over your attention. It demands your attention. Yeah. It's something I like to think about when I'm making some music is like, what is the listener going to be doing when they hear this song? You know, like right. what what's kind of like the time and place for this track? Right. I, I don't know if I've really thought about that until like uh, one of the last bands I played in. We we just kind of said like we are gonna be playing in bars. You know, <laughs> that's like the scene around here. That's so where we get our shows. Content. So like uh -huh. no one wants to hear our artistic emotional journey. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. You know, just, they're, they're trying to drink and like have a good time. <laughs> yeah, we were just making songs to like hype everyone up. <laughs> and, it, and it worked in those environments really well. Right, of course. But um, yeah, like the scene at, at the time especially was just like 
people were there to drink and you happened to be right. playing. It wasn't so much they were coming to see you play. They're not coming to see you. You guys are providing a service. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. we were like, well, let's just, uh, let's feed it. <laughs> but it was a really like important shift for me to think about what the point of what I'm doing is. That's cool. Yeah. I think that's a really, imp I mean, it's hard. It, it can actually be paralyzing to overthink things like that. To, to like, okay, how is my listener going to hear this? Is it here or is it here? And I can't do this. If Like you can get lost in that and it can, it can actually complicate things. But I agree, giving it a little bit of consideration is helpful. I also think that I wish, like there's so much music, like I think what, like 80,000 songs come out on Spotify every day? Yeah, I'm um, sure. Like I wonder how many artists really ask themselves, what is my function? Why do I exist in this? Like, why, why, why should people listen to me? What value am I providing? Mm. How am I unique? What, what am I doing that no one else has done? What am I doing that needs to be heard? I think those questions are really helpful in standing out and defining yourself um, and liberating you from being like a cookie cutter version of someone else. Um, yeah, and it's something that's always changing and evolving. Like I'm actually rethinking currently, like this week, I'm going to be thinking about a lot. Like what is my function as an artist? What, what is the point of my being and why should people care? Mm. And I, I think when you understand that, then it gives you a lot of conviction and a lot of energy to create and do what you do because it's not aimless and it's not just about serving yourself and being successful or being famous it's like you're you're serving a greater thing i mean you can do both you know obviously i w i would love to be successful and famous but well i think i think that should be a byproduct of of something yeah. deeper that you're putting out into the world right not the kind of reason <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah well i think that's really tough to do because a lot of times the thing that makes you unique, the thing that makes you special are often the things we're like the least comfortable about. Oh yeah. It's, it's oh, the 100%. thing like when you kind of like look at yourself in the mirror stands out to you in a painful way almost like, whoa, that's weird. No one else has that. So we often censor that and edit that out. And Yeah. And that's, it's, yeah, I think that's, you're, you're doing everyone a disservice. I think that what people really want in today's world is humanity and realness and vulnerability. Maybe not everybody. There's some there's some artists that are like really specific and they're obviously not being vulnerable, but they make it work. But yeah, I think vulnerability is one of the most attractive things. And it's like what you were saying in class, like saying, I don't know, like that's you expressing honesty, maybe something you're not necessarily proud of. But that's what people connect to. Yeah, and uh, so much of what we're exposed to on a daily basis, you know, minute by minute with media and TV and, ev you know, everything is, is uh, really polished and really refined. And, and there's people sitting around desks planning it all out for mm -hmm. months in advance to get it just right, to hit the numbers and all of that. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it's... Uh, it's refreshing, you know, when you see something that's just, um, oh, wow, that's like real. Right. Yeah, you know, I really felt that um, when I first heard of like Billie Eilish, like mm -hmm. I, was, I heard it sorry, from my sorry, students. Sorry, Billie, Billie who? Billie, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I heard it first from my students and, um, you know, being an old man now, like a lot of like what they are drawn to. Old man? Yeah. <laughs> what are you talking about? You know what I'm saying? Like, like. You know, um, a lot of what the kids are drawn to are, to me, like, you know, uh, kind of base, you know, flashy about looks and glamour and the substance right. isn't always there. That's a generalization and it's not really fair to make, but, you know, that's, right. that's the old man in me coming out. So when I, when I first heard the, uh, her work, I was very surprised at how just vulnerable and real and raw it was mm -hmm. and she's so young too yeah like to me my initial re 
you know, unfair conclusion that I drew with no, no evidence was that she's just some young kid that like, you know, they've put up on a pedestal that they're making into a pop star, mm -hmm. which is really like exactly the opposite. Mm -hmm. um, so I was quite surprised that like the kids were really feeling that. And, and the thing that I thought was especially cool was like, there were some kids that were, it was their, they're their favorite, you know, we, we love her. And then the other reaction was like, I can't stand her. There wasn't a lot mm -hmm. of in between. It wasn't a lot of right. like I don't care, so it, it got a reaction on. That's the best so stuff. Polarizing, levels. yeah. Any art that's polarizing is like important. Yeah, so that's better than I don't care, <laughs> whatever. Yeah, I don't <laughs> care. I'm indifferent or lukewarm about this. Yeah, it it made me feel like hopeful though. You know that like maybe like we'll get away from like all of this like airbrushed, photoshopped kind of like media that we've, we've sure. gotten for so long and maybe like something a little more authentic can break through again because i think that's yeah. happened in the past you know when you look yeah, I think back we probably go in phases like we i think in general people just get bored of the same thing after enough time so hmm. we go in cycles i'm sure and maybe right now what we want is real and then maybe after that we're gonna want like super super refined hmm. who knows yeah but what's cool about music <laughs> is that there's so much music happening and there's so many different lanes and I'm sure at all at all times for the rest of the war the existence of man like there's going to be both the refined and the real and that's cool yeah that's true we we've got a much wider um you know pool to choose from compared to like yeah when compared you... to like the 60s or the 70s when you know there were like three labels putting out music yeah I think even into like when we were watching MTV, like, you know, like they only played so many songs. Exactly. And the radio, you know, when that was, once the internet came, it just blew it open. It just yep. gave us uh, all kinds of stuff to look at it, you know, maybe at the cost of, uh, you know, I don't think we have the same like, uh, <laughs> like musical heroes and superstars, you know, we, they're there, but I think there's like fewer of them. Yeah, well, that's something that's sad also about modern times is mystery has kind of been replaced by total transparency, which is cool sometimes, but, and this is like vulnerability that we're talking about, but when you see like videos of like all these girls like crying and screaming at a Beatles concert, it's like, they, back then, like nobody saw the Beatles anywhere. Like, unless you like bought their album or like maybe you'd see a, f a bad, like a really shitty photo of them in the newspaper. Like mm. you didn't, there wasn't Instagram. There wasn't all of these ways to connect with them. Um, right. John Lennon isn't like pouring milk in his coffee every day. No. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So they're, they're almost, they're not really humanized. They're, yeah. they're like gods amongst men. And then to be in their presence must've just been so special, you know? Um, yeah, the uh, the mystique is can be lost. It, I mean, it's great. Like you know, you can really connect, and that's, I guess. Yeah, the, it's got its pros and cons. It's something I struggle with personally because I know that like my, my, the whole intention of my art is vulnerability and transparency, and my name is just Stephen, and I want to just be the boy next door who's like your your friend and relatable and sharing sharing my journey with you. But I also think that there's a power to mystery. And there's a power to not just revealing everything. Um, and it's tough. I don't, I'm still figuring out how to, how to find that balance, like on social media and stuff. Mm. Um, yeah, that, that's an interesting, um, the, another interesting kind of like balancing act or contrast to find, to share that without, you know, because it would get to a point where it would just be like, um, you know, too regular, <laughs> too right, normal. Right. I, I've had that happen where I've seen bands that I love, and and maybe like um, like an example I stuck out to me was just like they, they were playing their songs and they were like superheroes on stage, and then the uh -huh. banter in between was like, "Hey, how y'all doing out there tonight?" Uh -huh. Oh boy! <laughs> and then all of a sudden it was just regular guy up there, and right. I was kind of like, 
Wait a minute. Which can do both, you know? It can make it it can make it better or it can make it worse. It's just so dependent on the music and what you want. Yeah. Yeah, and that's probably me, really. Like I'm the one that like came up with this weird problem in my head that like because <laughs> I'm watching them play and I'm just like, I can't even believe humans are making this noise right now <laughs> right and then it's right like, and then and then you realize how human he really is yeah oh it's, it sounds like the guy i ran into at the grocery store <laughs> you know right exactly Just regular yeah like i grew up like kind of with this idea of like rock stars as like superheroes anyway uh-huh sure i mean like when i i didn't even know that like if i got a guitar i could play the songs that i heard on the radio at until I thought it was just had a way friend that hard. had a guitar and showed me how to play a song. Right, right. But, but to me, like, it was just something at that point I just never thought of. I just figured, like, if you're a rock star, you were, like, shot down from some mountain somewhere. And right, <laughs> like you, you're endowed with this gift that no one else has. Yeah. Some yeah, superhero I mean, it's, quality. Yeah, it's, um, it's so not true. I mean, obviously, <laughs> some people have talents and things that mm -hmm. give them an advantage from the very beginning but i think the reason anybody is really good at what they do is because they fucking love it and they're really passionate and because of their passion they've put in a lot of work and it's through all of that discipline and all that hard work that we get good at anything yeah no one just picks up a guitar for the first time and shreds you know mm. I think I read something. I think it was Michelangelo, the you know sculptor. Um, he's. It was a quote, something like, "People think my work is so amazing, but if they, I totally ruin it. But it was like, if they knew how much time I put into it to get mm -hmm. here, they." Like he was right. basically it saying, like feel so special. they yeah. might think I'm like pathetic, basically. <laughs> right, 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 right. Exactly. Like, like to get this good means how desperate I am yeah. to be this good. Yeah. Like how obsessed, how much, how much I've had to sacrifice other parts of my life yeah. for these skills. Yeah, yeah. and that's that's why that's why like passion, man, is is the secret ingredient to being good at anything. Like when you're passionate, it's. Think things don't feel like work; they just feel like play, and mm. it's just easy to invest your time into something that you love. Yeah, and I I think you know also going back too. There's also the element of you gotta like go through the mud sometimes, and just do it. You know, it's, you're not getting your immediate happy that we were talking about. You're getting right. You're, you're denying yourself some of those instant pleasures because you know. Because I think that is, um, as far as I can tell, it seems to be like a myth that, um, you know, like people, you know, people will say things like music is life and um, these things that make you believe that like that's all these people do is eat, live and breathe music. And like, mm -hmm. you know, like it ignores the, the struggle of it. The like you do have to like push yourself and it is like training for an athletic event and you got to dig yep. deep sometimes. Yeah. I mean, anything in life that's rewarding is slightly outside of your comfort zone and it requires you, like you said, to walk through the mud. And uh, for anybody out there pursuing a dream or going after an endeavor when you're faced with a challenge or you're faced with um, disenchantment or lack of enthusiasm or being scared it doesn't mean that you shouldn't keep going it doesn't it's that's not a signal that you need to stop or that this isn't for you that is a really important part of the process and that's going to happen for the rest of your life hmm. and you, it, it it's learning how to how to do that and how to get through it. Yeah, yeah, um, those yeah. those pitfalls and those obstacles are on the path, and you're yeah. going to encounter them. Yeah, because <laughs> I think we romanticize a lot of art and creation, sure. you know, because it it is amazing. Like I'm not trying to take that away from it. It's it's incredible when you can go in and come out with like a really cool moving piece of music. I mean, that's why I think anyone does it. But 
it's not always just like the sunbeam hits you through the window. No, and- <laughs> no, no, no. I do think that the more, like, when I was creating my first album, it was a lot of banging my head on the wall. Like, I was less experienced. Mm. Um, I was really writing songs that I was singing on for the first time. And it was an obsession to get these songs finished. Like, some of these songs took me two years to complete, you know. Um, and this time around, years later, after having so much more experience and being better at everything that I do, it it becomes more effortless and it becomes more playful and that's something also to remember and to look forward to is that it gets easier like the better you get at stuff the 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 more you can access like flow state and the more you can just effortlessly do things and the more you can challenge yourself to do to do more um so yeah yeah you get less caught up on technical things and yeah, lack exactly. of understanding yeah that's i mean even if it's just knowing your keyboard shortcuts like yeah and like that, that is so fulfilling out. man when you yeah. recognize your growth like mm-hmm. and sometimes it's hard because we grow so slowly like we take one step at a time so we always just we always just see the step we were at before and we just feel like we're haven't really done much but then you have these moments where you're like oh my god i can't believe like how easy that was or like I sounded so good there or wow that, like that was the easiest song I've ever made what the heck mm-hmm. like those those feelings are so nice yeah once in a while you get that once in a while yeah 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 oh, I've I think um, you know to bring it back to like kind of like the mindset we were talking about the listener but there's also like the creator's mindset I've I've been in situations where I've it goes both ways really but maybe I'm working on something I'm not really feeling it and then I listen to it like a day later. I'm like, whoa, or a week or a month, you know, whatever it is. And you're like kind of surprised, like, that was pretty cool. Like, whatever happened with that? Yeah. I, I, it made me want to ask you, um, we were talking about like the audience mood, but there is the creator's mood too. Like um, sometimes if you sit on an idea too long, you're just not in that space anymore. Like it's not oh, for yeah. you anymore. Um how fast do you like to work? Like when you're when you're doing a song, when you're working on a track, like are you are you trying to bust it out as quick as possible so you can ride that feeling, or or can you like kind of come back to it? Yeah, so I've had to learn this the hard way uh, through years of um, falling into the same pitfalls, and um, I've noticed that there's like a seventy-two hour guillotine maybe (laughs) where if you don't execute enough of the idea in a short amount of time 72 hours it becomes increasingly difficult like exponentially more difficult to complete the Mm -hmm. missing pieces so i'm not saying that you have to finish the entire idea in x amount of time but i find that all of the important parts like the texture of the beat of the of the music the all of the writing like maybe maybe lyrics can some lyrics can be out but like i gotta get all the melodies i have to have a pretty fleshed out arrangement um yeah and it, it needs to be like listenable like i need to be able to play this idea for myself or for anybody and not need to front porch it or like explain what's missing um mm-hmm. So yeah, I think like within three days, I try to get a song to like 80%. Yeah. You know, it's really important for me. I, I can't do the slow, I can't sit on things because I'm I'm such an emotional creator. The second I lose a feeling, it becomes really hard to add to something. Um, and the more you hear something, the, the less you feel it and the more you just hear sound. Mm. Yeah, there's like, I guess, two things going where it's hard to tap into that emotion but then it's like the idea itself kind of slips away from you as your moods change over the you say three days you know yeah it really does Um, i I sometimes i mean i i find it like it can be as much as like a half an hour (laughs) where sure yeah yeah oh yeah you can lose it really fast and that's why having a good idea is like exhausting too like there's this kind of manic state I enter once I like I'm fishing I'm fishing I've sat down I'm starting creating 
all of a sudden there's that spark and I'm like, oh my God. And then once you get that spark, it's a combination of like being enthralled and just so excited. But there's also this fear of mm. not completely reeling it in mm -hmm. and like falling short and failing. So um, yeah, it's weird. Having a good idea is is a burden. <laughs> Because yeah. ideas are a dime a dozen, execution is everything, mm -hmm. and you have to now execute what what you see and what you're feeling, right. um, before you forget what it is that you're imagining, which is so easy. Yeah, and you're right; it slips away as fast as it comes. It does, man. Mm. I've actually found that a lot of the best songs I've made recently, a lot of my favorite ones, were the ones that were done like really fast. Yeah. So. Yeah, that, that happens a lot. Um, I mentioned to you uh, playing with some friends for the first time in a while. And um, we we don't like make anything up. We just start playing, you know. And That's the best way to do it, man. Yeah. You know, like we, we have a good chemistry. We've been playing together a long time in various forms. But um, it's like we just start playing a song. <laughs> we just, sometimes it comes out like right away. And it's just like, we just all, yep. we just felt it. We were there and, and like, they'll, they'll be like 80% of the song gets written the first time we go to play it. Yep. Yep. And those, those ones are just like, it's like, you just found it. You just like uncovered it under a rock. You're like, oh, there's one. And it's like, took yeah. it. But there's other ones you just slave over and they just... Yeah, those happen You know, too. there's something there, but like you just can't find you it. You can't quite get it, yeah. <laughs> and you know, something I've learned, and, and maybe this isn't the best advice for everybody, especially if you're newer to something, like slaving away is really important for getting better. Mm -hmm. Like it was when I was younger when I had to spend a week on a snare drum. I learned so much from that, you yeah. know. Um, but... I've learned that if I have to slave away too hard, like if, I, if I'm trying to hold on to an idea because I know what it could be, but I can't quite figure it out, sometimes it serves me to just let it go and just move on to the next thing and just keep rolling the dice. Mm -hmm. Like I think in, in um, music, like quantity for me really works. Like just create a lot of stuff. And sometimes you're going to roll snake eyes and sometimes you're going to roll like a, pair, like a 12. And I just wait for those 12s and then I just let the other ones go. So I think a, le like a level of detachment is important. Yeah, yeah. like nothing is precious. You know, no, no idea. Yeah, exactly. Like it's not, pre yeah, exactly. Th that'll um, get you in a lot of trouble if you are, especially playing with other people. If like, well, this is my guitar part, you know, it's gotta be. It's the, mm -hmm. this is me. You get your ego involved, and you are the guitar part now. And when they don't like it, they don't like you. <laughs> but right, being able to the, let things go will save you a lot of trouble. And I think you're right about quantity. That if you just keep going, try just move on. Like you get to like go through those all those stages over and over again. Mm -hmm. from start and to you're finish. just getting better and better at it. Yep. Yeah. But that's a good way to like squeeze the fun out of it too is if you're just that's the thing forcing you can totally water out of that rock yeah and the more that you and if you end up in a state of mind of like forcing things too often then you kind of just lose passion for it like the the thought of doing another one just becomes daunting mm. um i remember when i finished my first album i was kind of scared because i was like now i gotta do another one like i don't <laughs> know if i can do that again the same way i did that like that was that that, that was that was hard man yeah. Um, but yeah so we just change I, I think that my approach to things is always changing to support my love for it like um, yeah to make me enjoy it so doing things quickly really helps with that mm. so what are the there's like about 10 songs on this this new album 11? 11 yeah how long did that take you to work on? like from from I think making it probably your palette took me, to that's it we're done yeah i think it probably took me eight months maybe mm -hmm. maybe a little less um yeah and so much music was made you know like those are only the songs that i got far enough mm -hmm. and felt connected enough to
Those are the but I think for every song on that album in that yeah. eight month period, there was probably 10, 10 more that didn't get finished. Mm-hmm. So, and the way that I create generally is like I go in sprints. So like one week I'll just pop off. I'll just write like two songs every day. And by the end of the week, I have like this folder of ideas. Um, but actually something that I did differently this time around was I would, I learning from experience, I, once I had, an, once I had something I liked, I would try to take it as far as I can instead of just like moving on the next day. Like that's yeah. something I used to do is I would do a song Monday, a song Tuesday, a song Wednesday, song Thursday, song Friday, do that for a month and then go back and pick my favorites and work on those. But it doesn't work for me, man, because like I, I'm no longer connected to them. And, and I've also heard them incomplete too many times because mm. once you have a bunch of sick demos, all you want to do is like late at night, get stoned and just like... <laughs> jam jam to them you know but then you're jamming to something that's incomplete and you're used to hearing it that way yeah yeah they sometimes the demo just like turns into stone yeah exactly demoitis is like very very real i really struggle with demoitis yeah i mean one of the great thrills of mine too are like the next day putting the track on as i'm oh, going to work best, or whatever man. you know yeah, it's the best listening to I, it and I think I've learned though to to not like that anymore because I'm I'm mindful of what's what I'm doing when I do that. Yeah, I'm you, you, totally sabotaging every time I hear something incomplete. I'm making it a little bit harder to finish. Right, you're like drying the cement there. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm only gonna listen to this if I'm gonna work on it. Period. Mm. That's a good discipline because that kind of mm. gives you the reward of well, then I get to listen to it again. <laughs> yeah, save the save that that feeling of. That like masturbatory pleasure of hearing something you created. Uh, wait, save it for when it's done. You know, like mm-hmm. don't don't blow your load too early. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's maybe the the short hit of happiness. You know, in right? Yeah, it's the for same the thing. Thing there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, I think there's like definitely a point where that stops serving you. You know, it can be really nice to listen to something when you're not in the creative mode, just so you can hear it a little differently and maybe notice what it needs. Mm-hmm. Um, but too much and then it just sort of settles. It becomes harder to hear. Yeah, it settles. It's just, this is how it sounds, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. So that's cool. So, I, I mean, that sounds like pretty good time, really. Eight months. I mean, you do most of the stuff yourself, right? You're doing all the production and yeah, yeah, um, yep. This album, pretty much every song I did by myself. My cousin, who I live with, I had him do some like little additional production stuff on some things. Mm-hmm. He would pop his head in and and help me with a a lyric or a melody every now and then. Nice. Um, but yeah, I think I think. Oops, sorry. I think and probably for it's hard man I still haven't really figured out how to collaborate and get what I want out of it it always feels like a compromise and I'm not able to go to that place of non-judging free expressing and just trying things like because in order in order for me to make the stuff that I really like it it has to get ugly you know Mm. and I and I find it hard to open up with other people in the room like that Right. Um, so, and I and I love making music by myself. It's just my world. Like it's like a little escape for me. Hmm. Do you like to sort of? Um, I mean, because when you're making it by yourself, you're wearing so many hats. You're the performer, the writer, the producer, the engineer. You know, you name it. Mm-hmm. The mixer. Do you like to do those all at once, or do you kind of like batch those tasks at all? I don't have a process and I, I every time I've tried to develop a process it just or every time I look back on a song and I'm like what worked about this and then I try to do it again it doesn't work mm-hmm. so something I don't do anymore actually which which was always an issue is I would write a really sick beat and then I would try to write over the beat like the next day and like that's so hard. I ended up with so many sick beats that didn't have any melodies. <laughs> um, if I just write the song, 
like whether it's on guitar or just like some some one patch just the chords and the 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 uh the melodies it's really hard for me to create the music under it that brings it to life um so i find i'm kind of doing it all at once and it's all happening together mm -hmm. which is difficult it's really hard but i think the more that you you do that the better you get at it yeah well, i think when you're by yourself i mean this could go both ways but you kind of have the freedom to like just try something totally different you know like start yeah with you're also not wasting anyone's time you know there's nobody relying on you to do something quickly so i can sit there for four hours and just go into this rabbit hole of weird shit and come out of it and not get anything and that's like okay because yeah. not it's just me right but you don't really have that courtesy when you're like in the room with with another artist or a writer or producer hmm. i found too a lot of times you know when like musical projects start they're very exciting in the beginning because it's all new yeah but it quickly sort of like becomes the way we work like okay well we made that song or those few songs that way so that's how we do them all now uh -huh. it can be a little harder to just kind of wipe the slate clean and be like all right now what are we going to do which yep. by yourself you have that freedom every time yeah i part of what really inspires me in the creative process is um is like novelty so i think i think what i probably do end up stumbling into little tricks and things and like go-tos and and processes that work for a couple days or a couple weeks hmm. but then the second that i'm no longer inspired by that and it doesn't feel new i have to change it up so yeah i mean for me such a key ingredient in making anything worthwhile is chaos and madness hmm. yeah i get that that's when i start like reorganizing things and moving stuff around <laughs> yeah exactly and this is why this is why having a really organized um like knowing your sounds and knowing your samples and doing all of that prep work is really important because then you have the courtesy of kind of losing control and going mad but still having like um a controlled environment in which you're doing it in hmm. yeah i hear you that's uh it's also um just it's refreshing because i've always find things you know like if you go through your computer you've got a bazillion sounds and plugins and samples that i i often oh, find yeah. things that i never got around to yeah, it's it's great. Yeah, it's it's fun to find something. I find myself using the same like ten plugins. Like, <laughs> I I don't use like a ton of plugins. I just the ones that I use, I just know really really well, and I know exactly what to do with them. I think that's important too. It's it's really easy to be paralyzed by mm. options. I, I totally agree. I think you're so much better off knowing a few things well, because most of and, the stuff does the same kind of thing anyway is everything else it's just and this maybe. is why limitation yeah exactly and this is why limitation is so cool too and like anybody out there who's looking at someone like an artist they look up to and they're like oh but they're so good at this and they're so good at that and they're so good at that it's like that's cool but part of like you not part of but entirely your uniqueness as an individual is based off your limitation hmm and it's your limitations that give you your character and um i've actually seen it happen to people where someone who's too who knows too much about music and can do everything is actually trapped by their knowledge it's like because they're not limited and they can go in any direction so limitation is also a key ingredient and um it's okay to feel limited um because it gives you only so many options which is helpful yeah i think that's where the creative thinking happens if you have i don't think just choosing between another option is necessarily creative it's more like all right we're kind of stuck <laughs> how are we going to get around this yeah you exactly. start getting clever ideas that way yeah exactly hmm. that's cool so what what are you working on next i mean i mean i know your album's coming out right now but uh I guess probably not touring at this point. Anyway. Yeah, not touring, unfortunately. I, I really want to, but the corona thing. Yeah. 
Um, but I, I am going to be, so I, I'm setting up, I'm switching. So this, the room I'm in right now is, is um, it's going to be my studio. I'm setting it up right now. Oh, um, this, this My studio was upstairs in a smaller room, but I'm actually going to, one of my priorities is creating like a little bit of a stage back here behind me, like a place where I can perform oh, cool. for like live streams and yeah. stuff. So I think I'm going to set up a, a live show. Um, I got to figure out, this is the hard part about the way that I create music too, is like you got to figure out how to perform it. Mm -hmm. Whereas like when you're in a band, you perform it, you know the song and then you record it. It's yeah. like the opposite. And um, so I got to figure out exactly what I want the performance to feel like and be like. Um, so I'm focusing on that. I'm also really looking forward to getting back in the studio and creating. It's been a couple months. I had a little spurt maybe a, t a month or two ago, which was really fun. But um, yeah, I can't wait to just like dive back in. Right. Yeah, you just like to get in. <laughs> I just want to go on, move yeah. on to the next thing. Yeah. Well, that's cool. Um, when you, in the past, when you play, do you play by yourself? Do you play with other people? No, in the past I played with a band. I had, um, I had a drummer and a bassist. And for a little while I had a keyboard player, but I ended up just playing the keys and I play guitar and um, would sing and like play some drum machines and like I, I was do I was running around the stage and being a percussionist like an orchestral percussionist when I was in middle school and high school actually really helps with that because being a percussionist it's yeah. like <laughs> you pick up a tambourine for like you know two measures then you go to the crash cymbals and you hit those and then you run over to the bass drum it's like right. <laughs> you know it's like a aerobic kind of performance so I feel prepared that that helped prepare me for that kind of stuff. But this is going to be even more crazy because it's just going to be me. Mm. You think you might um, use like live to do it? Ableton Live? Yeah. I mean, I used Ableton Live even when I was with the band. We played mm. to a click, which sucks, honestly. Like, I would rather not play to a click. I'd rather it feel really raw and live. But it's it's too hard with the music that the way that I make music. I mean, so many of the sounds are just like resampled and and there's yeah. so many background things that you can't you have to right. keep it in in time and play along to some stuff so hmm. yeah that's always a tricky balance um but i mean your music from what i can tell has a pretty like it doesn't feel very like um to the grid tempo like bpm the metro no. is the word I'm looking for. Sure, like, sure. It, no, it it's has very like loose. a nice loose vibe to it. Yeah. So yep. I th um, I'm sure you could have some fun, maybe even, you know, without the, some of that by yourself, maybe more so than when you have to rely on others to also like make the same you right. know, timing decisions as you. Yeah. I mean, I, that's a, because a, I am like a drummer first and foremost. That's my, definitely my most adequate instrument. And, something I'm always playing with in my songs and something that gives every song its character is like the swing of things and the looseness of things mm -hmm. and the playing between things being tight and things being sloppy. Um, a lot of times, like, actually a lot of the songs on the album, I started with drums and I used this plugin called Atlas, which randomly goes through all of your drum samples and just like puts them on a keyboard. So I would just like press a button and all of a sudden all these samples that like maybe I haven't even heard are just aligned on my keyboard hmm. and I can just perform them. Oh, and like cool. a lot of the drum beats, I actually didn't even perform to a click. I would just play them and then I would figure out what tempo it was at and like maybe have to slide a couple things. But there's like a real naturalness that comes from doing stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, that's pretty neat. So then you, you're kind of like making, I guess, the palette of drum sounds and then you're just rearranging them now with the keys. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Hmm. Yeah, I like that. I like your your way of thinking of like making these sort of like like you call them palettes of like sounds that you can then kind of use as stepping stones. Yeah, I mean the I, I'm so the best thing and something I want to keep figuring out how to do more of is like having quick access to sounds and things on my keyboard that I've never even heard before. Like, um, cause that's where I get so inspired when you press a note and it's like a sound you haven't even heard. Like you could press any note and it's just like, Oh, 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah, I get a lot of inspiration out of new sounds and Oh yeah. You know, a lot of times that's the fuel that gets me going. It's like, oh yeah, now I want to make something with this. Mm hmm Exactly. Mm. Nice man. Well that's cool. I, I wish you luck on that new project of doing some live stuff from home and Thank putting you. the studio back together. I guess you'll have that that grand piano behind you too to yeah, work with, well, which is well. nice. Yeah. Nice, man. Yeah, I'd, I'd flip it and show you right now, but it's uh, terribly messy. Yeah. yeah no, no problem. <laughs> I believe you. <laughs> That's cool, man. So um, where do you like to send people uh, primarily to check out your work that we can tell them to go to? Um, I mean, Spotify, Apple Music. Okay. Um, just listen to the songs. Um, Steven I just P-H. put out a music video. Yeah, Steven with a P-H, S-T-E-P-H-E-N. Um. There's my Instagram is at I think I'm crashing. No G <laughs> at the end there. And uh I think that's probably why my Spotify doesn't match my Instagram following. Like I only have like sixteen thousand followers on Instagram and I think it's because people can't find me. <laughs> Cause my name's just Steven and my ha- my handle has nothing to do with my name. Yeah. Um That's probably a tough one to search, especially it's like, probably hard to find, yeah. yeah. But I also think a lot of my listeners aren't like Instagram people. Like I think they're kind of off the social media in that sense. Maybe they're just like really into the music. Who knows? But could be. Um, yeah, you can. And then you can go to YouTube too. Like I just put out a music video for Delilah, which is like really powerful. Mm-hmm. Um, shot it. Shot it. The directed by my buddy Mason. Um, yeah, it's really cool. So cool. YouTube. I'll put that in the Spotify. show notes too. Nice. Yeah, it's it's been a lot of fun for me to get into some of your stuff and and like learn and uh, like I said, I like the uh, the thought that goes behind it and this um, very reflective kind of thing mm-hmm. and um, philosophical backing to a lot of what you do, mm-hmm. which I think mm-hmm. is really nice. So I recommend cool, man, I'm happy you guys. You feel that. Yeah, I recommend you guys check them out. Stephen with the PH and. Um, They'll be. I like that. That should be my name, Stephen with a PH. That'd be sick. <laughs> That's tight. I like that. All right. <laughs> Glad All I right, could we're help. changing it. It's official. <laughs> yeah. So check out his work. I think you'll like it a lot, and uh, a lot of cool production stuff in there too. Just you know, we talked mostly about like the songwriting, but I mean like production-wise, it's it's stuff I think people listening to this will enjoy just for that, if nothing else. So um, a lot of good reasons to check it out. So have a great day, everyone. Thanks for listening. Thanks, guys.